great. That way, if someone wants to see this later on, you have two ways of looking at it. You can pull up the lecture notes off the, the website, or you can, you'll be able to look at the recording. Hey, it is, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I um, am Monroe Weber Shirk, and I'm very happy if you call me Monroe. That's, I'm very comfortable with that. Um, I taught at Cornell University for many years and developed the, the Agua Clara program there um, and in partnership with, uh, with a partner organization in Honduras, Agua para el Pueblo. Uh, I first taught like the, the very early precursor of this course in 2004. And I'm realizing that by the, the time scales that you are all used to, that is a very long time ago. Um, it means that I've, you're, you're thinking, oh no, we're gonna, we're gonna listen to lectures that this guy has given 17 times and it's gonna be awful. Um, but the good news is that uh, we're working in a field where there is a lot of change. And so there's hardly anything or perhaps absolutely nothing that's in my notes now that were that was in my notes in those first years. And there's been a gradual replacement of things that are in those notes as, as we learn about how to treat water for, for communities that don't have a lot of resources. So anyway, that's me, I'm Monroe. I'm a, I've been working on drinking water treatment for a very long time and I'm super excited about this opportunity. So we're, we're gonna begin with, I've got, uh, a number of slides just to get us like the context for this course. And uh, then we'll have a time a little bit later on today to introduce each other or introduce ourselves so that we begin to get to know each other. Um, and I'm hoping that I can time this, that we will all end up in the space where we do office hours so that you can learn where that's at so that if you have questions, you can know how to actually grab a virtual meeting with me very easily. So here's the outline. Um, we're gonna go this step by step. So what's this course about? We'll start there. Um, so this is about creating new solutions. So it's about creative thinking and about this particular problem of how in the world can we provide safe water to all the communities that don't currently have safe water on tap. And we're gonna challenge the myth that this task can be accomplished by applying traditional technologies. And we will identify opportunities for new insights. Um, we'll be talking about this new field of sustainable drinking water treatment and the technologies that go with it. And underlying this is a bunch of, under, uh, a bunch of assumptions. One is that we do need engineers to help create better solutions um, so that resource poor communities can have access to safe drinking water. Um, and another hypothesis is that there are new things yet to be invented that would make this better. So we're, we're not at the end of the road, there's more to learn in environmental engineering. And we will practice design thinking and we'll talk more about that sometime uh, once we have gone through a couple of design challenges. Um, we'll talk a little bit about design thinking. Um, it's a whole approach to how you design things um, so that they can actually work in the real world. And this is the course summary in a t-shirt um, done very, very quickly. So it's about flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and annihilation, i.e. disinfection. Um, so that's the course topics. There'll be some more things that will come in there that help make these things work. Um, so my goal is that we provide, all of us provide a safe learning environment where a bunch of things can happen, where each of you can develop a fundamental understanding of the processes that control the performance of each of the drinking water treatment steps and hence how you can design them to be as good as possible. And so that each of you experiences the, the power of using constraints and physics and this goal of sustainability to guide the design of infrastructure. So 
not just think about design as a simple homework problem, but think about it in the context of the real world and how you know, real constraints, including things like what's actually available in the market, what can you buy at a hardware store and how do you use that to help guide your design? This course is part of the Artwork Cloud ecosystem and that ecosystem has been designed for innovation and collaboration. So there's Agua Clara Reach. I didn't share this, but I am a uh, I am the technical director for Agua Clara Reach, which is a, a nonprofit organization that provides technical support and designs for partners who are building the water treatment plants that we are designing. So there are volunteers that help out with Agua Clara Reach. And then there's this cool part where you come in. There's university research and there's university programs um, that are created to so that people are learning about these new technologies and helping to create better technologies. So that's um, happening at Ohio State University, at New Jersey Institute of Technology, and at Cornell. And we call that the RIDE program. RIDE stands for Research, Invent, Design, Empower. So four cool words, research, invent, design, empower. Um, but that's not enough to actually get things done in the real world. We also work with partners who are in, out in the rest of the world and who are the ones that can build the water treatment plants. So there's several of them, Gran Vicas, Agua para el Pueblo, who are the implementation partners. We provide them with designs and technical support and best practices. They provide us with insights and problems that then help guide the design. So there's new ideas coming from research partners. There's problems coming from the field. Um, and Agua Clara Reach kind of mediates those conversations and helps create better designs. Um, and we just had a lovely experience working on that this morning. Um, and then the partners, see, we still didn't get anything on the ground yet. The partners work with communities to build the plants so that communities can have a water treatment plant and get safe water on tap. And so that's where it finally hits the real world fully um, is where a plant gets built for a community. Uh, and then there's more pieces to this and you could keep on adding more connections because every member in this organization has other connections that end up mattering or being important. So the implementation partners have to figure out where the money comes from to build these plants. So there's, and, and the regulatory environment for building a water treatment plant in a country. So the water ministry is involved. There might be development banks that are helping to fund it. There may be bilateral donors involved. And I could go on and on making this web more and more complicated, but that's enough to give you a sense of where this course fits, which is inside that piece of the university program and helping to support ultimately research uh, university research. My expectations, and we can evolve this as we as we think about all of this, but my expectations are that you come to class ready to learn, um, that you share your video if if possible. And I recognize that there are times when you can't, but if you can, I really, I really like that. I really like being able to see you and 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 hopefully recognize when you're giving me the I don't understand this look. Um, you may have to maybe exaggerate that a little bit so I catch it. Um, we are learning with you. I am in the process of updating the lecture notes um, because we continue to learn about water treatment. The assignments for this year are, are all completely new. And the reason for that is we are using better tools. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and that means that you will undoubtedly discover something that doesn't work as you expected. So you'll be starting an assignment and you're like, what did Monroe mean in question two? It makes no sense to me. So when that happens, you could either get really frustrated and angry at Monroe for not being clear, um, or you could recognize that Monroe is also a human and he might've messed up. And so talk to me. Um, so this is, it would be just crazy luck if you didn't ever feel frustrated in this course, right? You're going to feel frustrated at some point. And the question is, what do you do with it? So my request is come to us, send Patrick and Claire and me an email saying what you found, what your, what the problem is, and, um, we will respond. Of course you could, as a, 
as a first step, you could check with one of your buddies and, and see like, does this make any sense to them? And if it doesn't make any sense to them, then, then hit us and we will, we will help you out, okay? Um, it's part of our, I feel like it's part of our contract. We'll be the best that we can to be responsive and you do the best that you can to, when you're getting frustrated with something, let us know. Okay, course organization, you got those emails. By the way, let's have a show of hands. Did everyone receive the emails from me and Claire? I've got everyone except we're all in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so one thing's working. Um, so that means that you have this information. Um, and I mentioned there about office hours. My goal is today, if I can, we'll finish on time and we'll pop into the office hour location so you can see what that's like. Okay, we're trying to learn new things, all of us. We're trying to learn new things. And the question is, how do you learn? I'm wondering if you could think for a second, when was the time in your life when you think you might've been learning like faster than ever. And go ahead, unmute and just shout out something of a time when you think you were learning really fast. Uh, I'll say when I was starting a new job. Excellent. So you're starting a new job and you had just lots of things to learn. That's great. Others? A time when you were learning really fast. I'd say like high school, middle school. High school, middle school. Okay. Okay, I'm going to change the factor to think about this. When do you think the number of things that you were learning per day was largest when you divided it by what you already knew? Like when we were kids? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't actually, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't actually know when we were learning the fastest. But I, I have this bet that sometime right around age two, we were just learning things so, so fast. Um, so now, if you accept that you were learning things really fast when you were a really young kid, what what were you doing as a two-year-old that enabled you to learn quickly? You were cramming all night to get that essay written, right? As, as, as like a two-year-old, like you said, you're probably just like doing everything that you thought possible. Like whatever you saw, you just kind of took on without regard for any constraints or anything that could be aware. Yeah, you, you took on new things without any regard for constraints. Other, other thoughts about what you were doing as a two-year-old? That made Asking learning fast? Say it again. Asking a lot of questions. Yeah, asking a lot of questions. I forget when the word why starts to really come up with children. What else? Probably making a lot of mistakes. Yeah, and, and did you remember feeling really bad about those mistakes? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Isn't that great? So that's the spirit that I want you to bring to this class that, yeah, we're gonna all mess up, we're gonna make mistakes, and we're gonna, we're gonna learn as fast as we can. And, oh, wait, there's this other cool idea. As a two-year-old, what did we call it when we were learning things? Playing. Playing. Isn't that interesting? So the goal is to bring that spirit of play to, to the design challenges that you're gonna have in this class. 
so and when you're thinking about playing, um, what kind of atmosphere do you need to have so you can play? What makes it possible to play? An you know, upbeat, welcoming kind of area. An upbeat, welcoming area. Yeah. You have, you have to have like the drive and want to play. You have to want to play. You have to have some energy, right? That's like a reward system that makes you want to play. Yeah. You're thinking about like in our own bodies, there's a reward system for playing. We get pleasure out of it. And, you know, did you play because your parents scolded you and said, now you must play now? No, right? It was, you played because there was like an open space. You had, as a two-year-old, you had time on your hands. So can you think about your ability to learn based on, like, for example, if, if uh, you knew you had to, learn how to, I don't know, hit the baseball. And you had weeks to figure this out, how you would feel about it versus if you were just, you had to learn how to hit a baseball and you had one hour tonight and you had to, you had to get it done. So one of the insights is, you will play much better, you will learn much better if you can do, if you can work on it, sorry, you can play, you can play with the assignment when there's still time in reserve, when you're not feeling a huge time crunch. Because once you start feeling the time crunch, the joy of play goes out and your ability to learn goes down. Which is why we have uh, a system where we require that you submit a draft two days before it's due. And we expect that it's like half done by then, just to make sure that you've played before the assignment is actually due. Um, so that's why drafts and final submissions and teams so that you have others to play with um, and so that you can learn faster because you can, you can talk to other team members and say, hey, how did you do this? And you can figure things out faster together. Um, Claire will be um, having office hours and I will be there as well. So Claire will be there to help you. Uh, and, and hopefully you feel comfortable coming to either one of us. Um, and we're gonna be doing it in Onshape. And so now you, you're probably wondering about Onshape. I have a question. Did any of you ever use Onshape? Anyone? Okay, we're all starting out right at the beginning, okay? So we're, it's a flat playing field. You all have exactly the same advantage. You're gonna learn this new software program. And I'm realizing that um, this is a change from when we first began creating the syllabus for this course. Um, initially, we thought we would be using Python. And then over the last half year, we realized, wait, there's a much better tool that just allows us to do so much more in engineering. Um, so we're using Onshape. Onshape is the fastest growing CAD program as far as user base. So it's growing really, really fast. It is completely online. It is completely free. So you can use it for anything that you want. You don't need any special hardware. You can, as long as you have a computer that can support a browser, you can, you can do CAD work. So no expensive computers needed. Um, and this has been our evolution. We started years ago with MathCAD, which handles units nicely, and we linked that to AutoCAD. So we wrote code in MathCAD that would develop, that would in turn create code that we could pop into the command line of AutoCAD and have AutoCAD draw things. And that was, I thought it was awesome, but in retrospect, it was a pain to maintain. Um, then we switched to Python, and we began looking for a different CAD environment. We liked Python because it's open source, um, and, so, and it also handles units elegantly. But there was 
there was no easy way to integrate that with 3D modeling. And so Onshape finally pulls things together. So Onshape can handle units well. Um, it allows us to integrate hydraulic design like process design with the 3D model, the actual sketches and 3D model of the thing that we're creating. And so that's the platform that I want you to learn into. Um, it's, it's a tool that I wish I had 20 years ago, um, but now we have it. And so let's learn how to use it. Your first assignment is to learn how to use Onshape. And Onshape has great tutorials. And so you'll be using those tutorials so that you begin to learn how to use Onshape kind of uh, so that you can sketch things up, create drawings uh, in Onshape. Um, and the goal is to have that done by, the, by January 20. And that you can start on today. You don't need me to give you any lectures to start learning how to do Onshape. When I learned Onshape starting like two years ago, I didn't have anybody giving me any talks. I just went to those tutorials and started learning how to do it. So that's your task to start today. Um, so now is introductions. Okay, so um, make sure that your Zoom name is right. I think you've probably already all done that. Um, and then this is what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna go around and I will, I suppose because I forget on Zoom, do we all see things in the same order or is it different for every one of us? It's usually it's different, different for everyone, but you can set it as the host so that everyone can mirror your view, but that might be like easier to do later instead of working it so, out now. Yeah, so what we will do is after each person introduces themselves, I will say who the next person is and I, have, I can see on the screen and so that's no problem. Um, so this is what you do, and I will model it. So my name is Monroe. And then we do this little thing where we, we talk, about some, talk about something that you did with water. Okay, so here I go with mine. Monroe bought a 50 foot long snake at Lowe's. Monroe used the snake to unclog a drain on New Year's Eve. Monroe was very happy to see the water go down the drain. Okay, so you're gonna each come up with one of those. I'll give you a minute so that you can think about what it is that you're gonna say. The idea is to use your name three times if you can. Um, so make your little story. I'll give you a minute and, and then we'll go around the room. Maybe thumbs up when you're ready. Okay. Um, let's start and let's start with Daniel. Hi everybody. Um, I go by Dan, I can't change it, but um, Dan worked on a capstone project designing an Aguaclara treatment plant. Um, Dan really liked his teammates, they were awesome, and Dan is excited to apply this class to that project in the spring. Thank you, Dan. Finn, are you ready? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, my name is Finn. Um, last summer, Finn spent a lot of time at a lake swimming in the water. <laughs> um, Finn worked at an internship remotely, and he learned a lot of AutoCAD. Great. Thank you, Finn. Well, why not? Claire. 
My name is Claire. Uh, this didn't happen last year, but today uh, I was at work this morning uh, for a uh, gas for a heating oil tank removal. Claire did. And Claire, things. Claire did, Claire did, did this. those things. Um, Claire saw uh, an excavator hit a sewer main. Uh, Claire watched water rush into the hole and fill it with sewage water in about 10 minutes, and then Claire left. Good move, Claire, on leaving. Um, thanks, Claire. Tony. My name is Tony. Um, over the summer, Tony drove all over Northwest Ohio. Tony collected a lot of water samples from farms and Tony is now analyzing them in the lab. Great, thank you, Tony. Victor? Hi, my name is Victor. Uh, over the summer, Victor was washing clothes in his washing machine. Victor's pipes in the house burst, so Victor had to clean up a lot of water. Excellent. I'm sorry, Victor. Ravi? Hi, my name is Ravi. Uh, over Labor Day weekend, Ravi drove up to Lake Michigan to see his uh, family and go to the vineyards and whatnot. Uh, the second day Ravi was there, he rented a boat and drove it in Lake Michigan and within 15 minutes got it stuck. And then Ravi had to spend the rest of the day pushing the boat out of the, out of the weeds. So Ravi was not happy. Ooh, we have a lot of disasters with water. Maybe we shouldn't use water. Thanks, Ravi. Hannah. Hi, my name is Hannah. Uh, over the summer, Hannah had an inter internship in Miami, Florida. Hannah got to go into the Everglades and Hannah collected a bunch of different samples in the Everglades in waist deep water. Excellent. Thanks, Hannah. Zach? Hi, my name is Zach. Um, last summer, Zach had a um, research position in food and science. Um, in food science, uh, Zach learned a lot more about how potato chips were made than he ever thought he would. Um, and Zach doesn't use that information anymore. Great. Thanks, Zach. Katie. Hi, my name is Katie. Uh, last year, Katie was an RA. One of Katie's residents toilets exploded and Katie's whole floor was flooded. Wow, we keep on on this theme. It's amazing. Thank you, Katie. Izumi? Hi, my name is Izumi. Uh, last year in September, Izumi started working for Agua Clara. She is trained as a structural engineer, so she's so Izumi is really excited to learn more about water treatment. Thank you, Izumi. Preston. Hi, I'm Preston. Uh, Preston is a sailing instructor for a city camp here in Columbus. Uh, Preston taught uh, sailing, kayaking, and canoeing to kids, kids age uh, 10 to 14. And uh, being outside during many hot summer days, Preston had to drink lots of water to stay hydrated. Good job, Preston. See, there is something nice that you can do with water. Thank you. Eric. Eric, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Eric. Uh, this past semester, Eric took a water resources engineering class. Uh, Eric got to model a water system in his uh, hometown of Dublin, Ohio. And Eric was very excited he could design a water flow system in uh, his hometown. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Michael? Hi, my name is Michael. Uh, over the last summer, Michael had the opportunity to inspect water lines being installed for a private development. And Michael had to communicate with the owner and the city when things were not done correctly. 
and Michael had to threaten contacting the EPA to make sure that these procedures were followed. Thank you, Michael. Isaac. Hi, uh, I'm Isaac. Um, last summer, Isaac spent a lot of time going out kayaking. And uh, one time when he went kayaking, his kayak flipped and he fell in the water and it was cold. Thank you, Isaac. I've been thinking about that these days. Not a good day to be out on the water today when it's so cold. Stephanie. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Stephanie last year went swimming in the Pacific Ocean and Stephanie was really excited because she hadn't been to California in eight years. Thank you, Stephanie. Mackenzie. Hi everyone, my name is Mackenzie. Um, this past summer, Mackenzie had the opportunity, she had an internship in um, Indiana. And so one weekend she took a trip, Mackenzie took a trip to Chicago and did a kayak architecture tour um, in the Chicago River, but it was also rainy and very gloomy that day, but it was still a lot of fun. Her McKenzie had a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, and let's see, Brendan. Hello, my name is Brendan. Um, so this past year, Brendan's parents' basement flooded Luckily, just with rainwater, not sewage or anything. Uh, and Brendan was thrilled to go back home and help clean that up. Great, thank you, Brendan. And then there's one more person and I don't know who your name is, what your name is, because you have a, a different name on the- Yeah, my, my name is Jin Yao. Jin Yao. Yeah. Hi guys, my name is Jin Yao. Jin Yao is from Malaysia, last year's some part of Malaysia was flooded because of uh, heavy rain and poor drainage system. So Jinyao learned that water management is pretty important regardless of where it is. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Uh, did, I, did I get everyone? Yes, all good? Um, I, as I was looking at each of you and looking what's in your background, I also noticed that that there are a whole bunch of us that have Christmas lights in the background. So that's cool. I see one, two, three, uh, four, five, five of us have Christmas lights. So anyway, there they are. Thank you. Um, and I will now return to a few more, um, a few more slides. If I can remember how to do this, there we go. Success on that. Um, why am I teaching this course? Okay, so how did this all happen? So I was uh, in refugee camps in Honduras in 1982-83 when, okay, you'll figure out my age when I was 19 and 20 years old. Um, and I'll show a few, few slides from that. and. That eventually, over a number of years later, led to this question about uh, slow sand filters, which is one of the water treatment technologies that makes a lot of sense for small communities. Um, and I learned about that in a course kind of like this one, um, a, a, a traditional water treatment class, and discovered that the professor let it out, that we don't actually know how these filters work. And that was like, oh, that's cool. No one knows how these filters work. And yet there are millions of people that depend on them. Wouldn't it be cool to figure out how they work? Um, I had an invitation to begin a water project in Latin America that happened in December of 2002, where a, a colleague said, hey, do you wanna do a project in Latin America? And I, I love Latin America. And I, I was like, yes, of course. Um, and that ended up connecting me with folks that I knew from Honduras from my time there in the refugee camps back in the early 80s. Um, and that eventually led to this question from our, the, the partner organization in Honduras saying, hey, how could we treat this water that we're providing to small communities? And I realized that everything that I had been taught, and by then I had a PhD in environmental engineering, and I realized that all that I had learned and had been taught about water treatment wasn't enough 
to solve that problem and that we needed more and better solutions. And so we've been working on that. And this is, um, this is, wow, this is 18 years later, um, 16 times having taught this, a course like this. And we keep on learning and there is still a lot more to learn. Like there are still many, many places where it's like, wow, I think this might be happening in this process, but we don't know for sure. And we certainly don't know how to optimize the process because we don't have any equations yet that describe it. So, so much more to learn. Here's just a few pictures from the eighties, you know, seeing people, seeing refugees from El Salvador wait in line to get water, seeing them use water. Um, here they're, they're washing corn that they're gonna use to make tortillas. Um, realizing that this is a water source for towns. This is, this is the water source for a town in Honduras and that that is the water that used to be coming out of their taps. And the king, yeah, this is a real problem. We need a solution to this. And this is that town. This is that town of Morosili that gets water from that river and they need a better solution than that dirty water coming out of their taps. So I began to search and I call this a search of truth for that matters, but maybe you wonder, like, is this really the right thing to be doing? Like, should you really be taking a course that's like an environmental engineering class? Shouldn't you instead be taking a business course or information technology course? Um, like environmental engineers have been applying the same drinking water solutions for the past hundred years. And goodness, the science behind environmental engineering is, is well understood. It's the same old stuff. Um, and, and really it's not up to us. Providing everyone on the planet with safe drinking water, it's not about engineering. It's about, it's about the money and the political will to actually apply those known technologies because we already know how to treat drinking water. Okay. I'd like, could we break into breakout rooms for like, Do you agree? Yeah, do you agree? Yeah, what do you like? What do you like? Are you going to switch your major now? Students, you should be able to, to join the rooms now. Let me know if you can't. Think about how much time to give them. Uh, let's see. It's it's three. We're doing fine for time, I think. Yeah, we still have forty minutes. I'd say three, four minutes. Yeah. Maybe okay. Three oh five. So, yeah. I I am surprised with how many of these students I I know. So I think it'll be a good a good group. I think there's only a handful that I have not met before. So. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. So you already have rapport with these folks. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are from the capstone. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. Usually it gives them like a minute, a minute. before it yeah. pushes them back. Here they come. Well, welcome back everyone. Um, and this was like Monroe. Monroe was very clear that I was going to do things that were 
challenging. And I, Hannah came back and, and let me know, yeah, this was hard because you didn't have access to see the screen where the question, where the, the, where the slide was with, that I was asking you to respond to. So sorry about that. Um, and I'll, I'll try to figure out a better way to handle this in Zoom for the next time I want you to respond to something that's on a slide like this. And I'm curious, how did you think about this? I just love any, any responses of like, how might you respond if, I mean, Monroe just told you these things. How would you respond? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why don't you agree? Why do you agree? Are you going to switch to business majors now? Um, go for it. Be brave. Jump in. Say what you have on your mind. Okay, so um, we had like two things and my team said I could speak for them, so I will. Um, the first was that you mentioned why even study this stuff, should we just switch to a business major? And um, the people who know these means and methods are out there, but they're not gonna be around forever. So it's still important to teach the things that we're using now. Um, and then the second component is that uh, these things are being implemented in the place where there's political will, but um, we might need to come up with new methods in the future for places where there isn't that political will or maybe isn't the economics that allow them to be implemented. Good job, Dan. Thank you and your, and your group. Who else would like to jump in with some things that your, your group said in response to this? Uh, being able to look at the prompt again uh, and going off of what Dan said, uh, just like wherever you go, um, when it comes to the econ or like just resources in the area, uh, especially in especially in places that don't have as many resources, you're always going to encounter you're always going to encounter pro problems. It's it's almost inevitable. I feel like over this the hundred years, there's all like you consistently run into problems no matter how much you plan for the plan for them either unforeseen or ones that you can anticipate um but i think j just like you can try to throw money at it but some of these again some of these problems that are so unforeseen you need those engineers that can think outside the box for those problems that and then so essentially you wouldn't know uh, what problems to throw money at until the engineers yeah. have actually figured out a solution to those unforeseen problems. So it's, you're always going to need engineers to an anticipate those unforeseen problems that somehow always find a way to exist in history yeah. when it comes down to creating new technology. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Who else would like to jump in? Um, I know it says like the science behind environmental engineering is already well understood, but I mean, as we progress and like people continue learning and exploring, like there will be new technologies that are explored and I believe they'll be figured out and could be applied in a lot of wide range applications across the globe and definitely will continue to evolve and potentially even lower the cost and make it more accessible. So I definitely think that it's not necessarily entirely understood. I think there's probably steps that we can take to still learn more. Um, yeah. just so we can be better off in the future. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I want to be really clear. Um, although environmental, environmental engineers have been doing things for safe water for over 100 years, um, there's still many, many things that we do not understand well. And there's still plenty of room for all of you to help innovate and create better solutions. So this was a slide that was not what I believe. It was just to get you thinking to see if, if you really believed us or not. So I'm gonna move on. Um, 
so this is my perspective on human knowledge. You know, you can think of knowledge as like there's this this sphere that humans are like slowly pushing out on. Think of it like a balloon and we're slowly pushing that surface of the balloon out further and further as we learn more and more things. So there's our balloon and we slowly expand it and hopefully it keeps on expanding. It doesn't contract again like that one did. Um, so that knowledge keeps on growing. That's one image, but now here's another image. Maybe it's not like that spherical balloon Maybe it's like this. It's just craziness. Like there are places where we know a whole lot about how something works. So maybe there's some piece of nanotechnology where we just know a whole lot about how those atoms are interacting with each other and, and how to make nanoscale structures. And we know a whole lot about how to make different kinds of drugs. Um, just a huge amount of information there. And maybe we know a tiny bit about what it takes to purify water. And this is an old one. This slide does go back to the very early days of the course. Um, and you guys you know, might not even know what WMD is. Anybody know what WMD is? It's weapons of mass destruction. And it was the, the, the term that was thrown around um, at the beginning or prior to the Iraq war. Um, and a number of countries on the planet, the number, United States being the, the best at this, is we know a ton about weapons of mass destruction because we've got lots of them. And so there's lots of engineering that has gone into creating the best ways of destroying the planet. Um, and in this course, we're working at that little, that little valley where, with, where we know a little bit about water purification. We're gonna try to like push that valley up a little bit and maybe borrow from some adjacent knowledge spaces, maybe learn new things. Um, and, and here's just like one of the funny ways that like it needs to be interdisciplinary. Like if you think about environmental engineering, environmental engineering has uh, historically been closely connected to chemical engineering. And so many chemical engineers or many environmental engineers have a degree in chemical engineering as well. So that connection has been very, very strong. And a connection with biology has become very strong as well. Um, a connection that might not have been as strong is a connection with fluids, like fluid mechanics, even though we're dealing with water. And it turns out that that connection is super, super critical for figuring out how to design good water treatment plants. Um, and I, I've recently wondered, like, is that one of the issues why it's so hard to get really good water treatment plants designed? It's because we don't actually have enough people who understand fluids well in environmental engineering. Who knows? But in any case, borrow from neighboring areas. Um, so we're part of this search of truth that matters, trying to extend this this balloon of knowledge. Um, Agua Clara is creating new technologies and this course is part of that effort to help create new technologies. Um, we develop the design algorithms for surface water treatment plants of any size so that we can design plants, whether they're really tiny plants or big plants, we can design any of them. And it's this beautiful thing where we connect math and physics and fluid mechanics and chemistry and geometry and economics and all those things to actually create a design. I have this, this memory of the first time I, I took a course in water supply engineering. And as part of that course, we designed a flocculator. And I remember after designing that flocculator, I was very confused because we, we knew how to design the volume of the flocculator, but we didn't know how to design how deep it should be or how wide it should be or how long it should be. We didn't have any, any insight about how we would set those parameters. And those parameters come from like knowing more about the whole story about how everything fits together. And then finally there ends up being constraints that help guide the selection of every single dimension that goes into a plant. Um, so that's where like the geometry ends up being a really interesting part of the design process.
And another piece here, I get very excited about the fact, have you ever thought about this? Like for example, there's this equation, F equals MA, right? You've all heard that one, F equals MA. Have you ever got excited about the fact that you can write down an equation and it actually means something and you can take that equation and you can do algebra on it. Like you could divide both sides by F or, or no, divide both sides by M. And then you could have F over M equals A. And that still means something. Isn't that amazing that the universe works that way? Like there could have been an alternate universe where, where none of that worked and it was just like chaotic and who knows what was gonna happen today. So happiness that we have, we can actually describe our reality using equations. And that's kind of at the core of what allows us to do things as engineers and be able to actually design things that even before we build it, we have a very strong sense that it's going to work because happily those equations do link with the physical reality. Okay, and then there's this other side. Oh man, what about, what about when things go wrong? Um, and groupthink is an example of things going wrong. And I'm trying to get you to not be part of groupthink, but to actually be willing to ask questions and, be, and to be willing to say that you don't believe what Monroe says. Um, groupthink refers to a faulty decision-making process where you're part of a group and you all decide to go down one path and you don't consider alternatives and as a group, what you value most is that you all agree with each other and you value that more than finding the truth. And in that case, you easily come up with solutions that you all agree on that are actually perhaps dangerous or perhaps result in the challenger disaster or something like that. The question is, how do you prevent groupthink where you all are happy to come up with a solution even if it's wrong because you all agree? Here's some ideas to help prevent that. So one is to admit that you don't know everything. I, Monroe Weber Shirk, do not know everything. Matter of fact, I only know a little bit about a very small number of things. Um, so most things I know nothing about at all. Um, encourage honesty, question everything. Just because someone says something with confidence doesn't mean that you should believe that it's true. Um, just like those sentences that I said about engineers and why you should all be business majors instead, like you should like, huh, really? Is he serious? Like, does this actually make sense? Or is there another way to state that's, that is actually much clearer and closer to reality? Um, be alert to jargon that doesn't actually meet, mean anything. It is very, very easy to pull, put sentences together with lots of technical jargon and it doesn't actually mean anything. So just because somebody can put long words together doesn't mean that they're communicating great ideas. Uh, you could check with outside experts to see whether like, do they agree with this proposal that you're making for how you're gonna proceed as a group? And this last one is hold a second chance meeting. This is like after you've, you're pretty sure you're gonna go down a path and then you could be like, okay, we're gonna very deliberately raise a question right now about is there some failure mode that we're not thinking about that would make this idea that we're about to embark on be a bad idea? Like maybe those O-rings in that challenger are really too cold and they're not gonna create a good seal at this temperature. So hold a second chance meeting where you are very open to dissent. And oh my goodness, a lot of this is about, you have to be open to people who have different opinions. And you can't like, clamp down on them and tell them to be quiet when they share a different idea that is different from the one that you had hoped to hear. How might environmental engineers fall in this thing of groupthink? Um, like I've been working on, so I worked on slow sand filters for more than a decade. I don't wanna discover that my technology is obsolete and that the years of effort that I put into it might have been a waste. But you know what, we're humans and we learn things and it's entirely possible that something that you dedicate a decade of your life on ends up being not a great idea. And it's far better to recognize that and move on than it is to like 
buckle down and, and say, I'm going to keep on working on slow sand filtration, no matter what anybody says, right? It's far better to learn say, okay, yeah, you're right. I've got to do something different. Um, we can confuse confidence and proof, like just because someone who looks like they're an authority figure says something with a lot of confidence in their voice, that doesn't mean that it's true. It means that they're confident, but it doesn't mean that it's true. Um, a reliance on empiricism rather than physics. So like, okay, we made all these measurements and we conclude something, but we don't actually have any like understanding of what is going on underneath. Like what, what is making the physics work this way? Um, and, a, and a confusion, we can, we, can be, can, we can fall into groupthink by thinking that just because we have the ability to use big words that we understand what we're talking about. So we can reduce groupthink by creating a safe environment for questions and for learning and for people to say things that we disagree with and then to have an open discussion. Is there a myth in engineering? Is there a myth in engineering? So when I talk about myth, myth can be a useful way of understanding a, com a complex reality. So we, we use stories, we use myth to talk about creation stories, for example. Myth can also be used to describe generally accepted but unproven hypotheses. So that's how I'm using it here, where there are things that engineers and scientists and others tend to believe, and they think it's true, but it's actually a myth um, because it, it was, it's unproven and it was a hypothesis and they didn't continue to hold the question of, is it really a pretty solidly known thing or is it just a hypothesis that doesn't actually have a whole lot of support yet? Um, so here's myth number one, science and engineering aren't influenced by myth because they are based on the scientific method. And that's a myth. Because yes, we try to base our things in the scientific method, but we're humans and we often jump to conclusions when we shouldn't yet jump to conclusions. So examples of myth, um, this is, these are old ones. Um, malaria, the word malaria means bad air. And so it wasn't the mosquitoes that were biting you, it's just that it was bad air. Um, there is this myth that streams purify themselves in one mile. There's the idea that, oh, when, you, when your child gets typhoid, it's because they were outside and there was, there was air coming out of the ground under conditions of low or sinking groundwater. And that's why they got sick with typhoid. So people try to figure out cause and effect and sometimes it's completely bogus. Um, and here's one that's really close to home for environmental engineers. We would like to believe, and there are plenty of textbooks that would show this, that chlorine eliminated typhoid in the United States. And I would happily have an hour long discussion about that and show that the data doesn't actually support that. Um, it was what the engineers at the time, at the turn of the century, at the, in the early 1900s, what they wanted to believe, and they thought it just made so much sense, and so they interpreted the data in that way, but chlorine didn't actually eliminate typhoid. So be skeptical. Expose that myth, and maybe we can expose some more myths. Um, and the first thing that you should do is you should not believe everything that I say. You should always be asking. How do we know that? Or why can't we do this better? Um, and this is disclosure time. There are many, many things that I have taught in this class over the 16 times that I've taught it in previous years that I now know are wrong or at least are incomplete understandings. So that's the state of knowledge. We are learning things. We don't know everything yet. The book is not yet closed. There's much more to learn. The challenge that we're facing is creating sustainable municipal drinking water supplies that provide entire towns with safe water on tap. And I would argue that we need the brightest and the best to create new and better solutions so that we can meet that goal. And apparently this challenge is more difficult than building a, a space station or designing a fuel cell or designing and building the web telescope because all of those things have already been done and we have not yet figured out how to provide everyone on the planet with safe drinking water. So let's roll up our sleeves and begin. 
It's a short walk to the edge of knowledge. There's a lot to learn. The edge is very close by. And if you never get anywhere this semester where you're like, wait, I don't know the answer to that. And, it, and I ask Monroe, he doesn't seem to know the answer either. If you don't get there, you've not tried very hard. You should get to the place where you don't know the answer and Monroe doesn't know the answer. Um, and maybe even Patrick doesn't know the answer. Okay, um, and it's okay. There's, remember, most things we don't know. We only know a few things and we're working on expanding that. Um, so it's a short walk to the edge of knowledge. There are significant knowledge gaps in every process that I will be teaching about. We aren't able to optimize surface water treatment processes because we don't yet understand the fundamental physics of many of those processes. We're working on that, we're getting closer, but there's still a ton to learn. So with that, this is my proposal. You all have that email of uh, links to different parts of the course. And one of those was a link to our office. So it's, a, it's where we're gonna have office hours. It is, it's, it's the Agua Clara virtual office. Um, I'd like to go there, um, but before we break, just in case there are any issues, are there any announcements that we need to make? Claire, Patrick? Oh, we should check in, like, what are you gonna work on? Like, what are you gonna do for this course? Wait for the next time we meet. Is there anything to work on? You're gonna work on learning how to use Onshape. And if you go to the, the course schedule, um, you will see that first assignment, which is about, I think about, it's called Part Studios, if I remember correctly. And I believe Claire also sent you a survey to fill out to figure out when office hours are. Okay, Does, is there anybody who doesn't know where the link is to get to the office? And I could stop sharing. Um, 